specified, I probably wasn't doing it at that point. Oh, magnitude of acceleration, so I don't have to worry about pluses and minuses. So I get 45 times 3.098 is equal to 12 times A. So the magnitude of my acceleration will be 45 over 12 times 3.098. Eleven point something. Eleven point one eight. And alternatively, Alternatively, going along this pattern here, my acceleration is going to be, well, that times this 1.9 again, so I got 5.8862 meters per second, times 1.9 meters per second, sorry, radians per second. Uh, for cosine, you get negative sine, so negative sine, 1.9 radians per second times sine. That's going to be my maximum acceleration. That's going to happen at my extremes. So if I multiply those two together, we should get somewhere around 11.18. But we do have rounding going on, so it'll be slightly off. So if we do a maximum, then we just have to multiply the amplitude by the angular frequency. The amplitude of velocity times angular radius. Yeah. So that would work the same for maximum speed? It would be the amplitude times the angular frequency. Yes. In essence, um, oh, we didn't solve for velocity as separately. If we had done energy, Just still holds. Uh, if my maximum speed, if you plugged in, well, the maximum speed should be. Yeah, there was a rounding there. The maximum speed should be six meters per second because that's how fast it's going once you hit. But if you did the energy, if you look at it from the energy point of view, the halves cancel out. You're left with V is equal to the square root of k over m times basically that maximum, which is just omega times the amplitude, which is what we do here, get over here. Mason. So, okay, so that just starts with cos on the formula sheet. What's the difference between starting with sine and cos? Cosine. All right, so let's say that we wanted to use cosine instead of sine there. So x, the amplitude is still the same, 3.098 meters, cosine of 1.9, whatever it is, radians per second times time, plus the phase shift. I know that x is equal to zero, at time is equal to zero. 
So I would plug this in for time, I plug this in for x. I end up with the cosine of 1.9t plus phi. So, sorry. The cosine of phi is equal to zero. So phi is equal to pi over two. Which means that if I'm using cosine, x is equal to 3.098 meters, cosine of 1.9 radians per second time plus pi over two. So if you start with cosine, you've got that extra phase, you have the phase shift there. Questions? So you said if we use sine when it's at the very start, no compression, right? Right. And then cosine at maximum compression, if it's anywhere, is it just anywhere that it's not right at the start? So if it's like halfway through, we would use cosine? Uh, I probably would use cosine, but there'd be a phase shift involved. So if we were actually doing, there's a variation of one of the experiments I did yesterday one of the demonstrations I did. And you use the motion sensor to map the, the progress. If you do that, there's always a phase shift because you'll, set it, you'll use cosine to map the function, but it's definitely, unless you get incredibly lucky, it's not starting at a maximum or zero. As I started on my answer, I realized that I sort of missed what you were asking. So, what's your question answered? I think so. <laughs> I have an answer in my head. I okay. That's what you're trying to get at. Go ahead. So, the work on the board right now is if the spring was not at rest when the object hit it. No, this is the spring was at rest when it was hit, but we started the time. We basically. Our time is equal to zero at that moment when the mass is at equal to it's rate. because you switched out the sine and cosine function. Yeah, that's that's what this is. That it has a phase. Okay, so you have to add the phase shift so it pretty much is the sine function. But yeah, yeah. I mean, the cosine of theta plus pi over two is the sine of theta. Tackle number six. There's a solid disc with a radius of 0.7 meters and a mass of 2.1 kilograms spinning at 45 RPM. A brake pad is applied 0.4 meters from the center of the disc and it slows to 21 RPM, positive 21 RPM in 0.62 seconds. This is a cake formula, angular cake. Is RPM revolutions per minute? Yes. So, one of the things you'll need to do is, for convenience, or you're keeping track of all the units, is get that into radians per second. All right, so we have a disc, and it's not that one. Seven meters. Uh, mass is 2.1 kilograms. <clears throat> Omega initial is 45 revolutions per minute. And Omega final is 21 positive revolutions per minute. And delta T, or time, was 0.62 seconds. So the first question is, what is the angular acceleration? What formula would you use? Uh, acceleration equals the final plus initial over two times time. That will get you average angular velocity. 
Oh, well, actually, and then if you multiply times time, that would tell you the angle, the angular displacement. What's the formula for acceleration? We'll translate, yeah, give me linear okay, acceleration. Omega final minus omega initial. Okay, we're doing angular then. Sorry. So you said final minus initial? Yeah. You're just stopping right uh, there? Divided by two time, time. Time, final yeah, answer. time, that's the T word. So it's delta omega over delta T, that's the tangent velocity over tangent time. So 21 minus 45. Um, actually, before we do that, let's get it, this into radians per second. Just because it might be convenient later. So, how many radians are in a revolution? Two pi. So, the two pi radians of a revolution. And then, seconds in a minute. seconds per minute. When I multiply, I need to make sure that the units I want to get rid of cancel out. They do. So 45 times 2 pi divided by 60 is 4.7. I was just going to say 3 pi. 1, 2. Uh, not meters per second, radians per second. Or three pi over two radians per second, and this one two point two radians per second. All right. So now so this. Uh, is two point two radians per second minus four point seven one two radians per second divided by point six two seconds. Slowing down, so the acceleration should be the opposite sign of velocity. Velocity is positive, acceleration is negative. That checks. Uh, initial moment of inertia of the disk. So then it comes down to what's the formula for the moment of inertia of a disk? One half m r squared. So that's one half times 2.1 times 0.7 squared. The average torque applied. So I know at the angular acceleration, I know the moment of inertia. How can I find the average torque? Yeah. Torque. The total torque is equal to I alpha. So 0.5145. Uh, it's kilogram meter squared times alpha, which was 
negative 4.054 radians per second squared. It's negative 2.086. Get it? Jules? No. Newtons? If you're stopping there, I know. Newton meters? Newton meters. Dealing with working energy, Newton meters are joules. Dealing with torque, it is not. And then the magnitude of the average friction force applied. So I have this disc here. And then it's like a brake pad. Brake pad is so it's spinning around in the positive direction. We'll make that the positive direction part. Make that the positive direction. Brake pad is applied at I think it was 0.4 meters away. So it's applying friction in that direction. Perpendicular to the radial, the moment arm. So R cross F is equal to negative 2.086 Newton meters. They're perpendicular to each other, so that's just RF, negative 2.086. R is 0.4, so negative 2.086 over 0.4. Or we'll just double check that. That's going off memory. Yes, 0.4. Which is 9 point something. And the question was, what's the magnitude? So I don't have to worry about the minus sign. It just disappeared. Did you normally the RF sine theta, or, but since it's 90 degrees, you just get rid of that? Yeah. You know, officially, sine of 90 degrees is 1. So officially, I multiply by 1. Number seven, a 35 kilogram mass at a fixed position at four, uh, four meters. Uh, seven kilogram mass is fixed at a position of negative one meters. At what position can another mass be placed that is in equilibrium? This actually is a question. Uh, this was a former textbook. Uh, that is a question that belongs in chapter six. So I'm going to skip over it. Number eight, a slinky, not massless. So this is based upon what we did yesterday where we have an effective mass. It's suspended so that it naturally hangs down 17.2 centimeters. 20 gram mass is added. It actually should be hanged, not hung, uh, on it causing the slinky to stretch to 23.1 centimeters, 20 gram mass is replaced with a 50 gram mass, and then it stretches again. So I have position and mass applied, or mass hanging. meters and kilograms. So when nothing is on it, it's at 0.172 meters. That's probably two meters. Uh, when I put 20 grams on it, so 0 0.02, it is now at 0.231 meters. 
And then when I put 0.05 kilograms on it, it's at 0.355. All right. So part of the question is, how do you deal with it? I, I don't remember if I had that lined up perfectly or not. Let's get a grid here. So if I had position versus mass, uh, so 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, 0 0.05, that's a kilogram. My position here in meters, uh, so we'll do 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Let's see how close we can get this. So when nothing is on it, it's at 0 0.172, puts it about here. Apparently it doesn't like that. When I have two, 28 grams on it, it's at 0 0.231, going around there. And when I have 50 grams on it, it's at 0.355. And they're somewhat lined up. Ultimately, I want the slope here. Now, how can you find the slope? Displacement. Do you want to use? We have three choices here. Two, three, one. Which ones? Second and third one. Second and third one. All right. So I know that mg is equal to k delta x. Um, I'm trying to find k. K is mg over delta x. So that. Basically, the inverse of the slope as we did yesterday. So 0 0.03 over 0.124 times 9.8. So we get a straight constant. 